My name is Max there. I'm here to talk about uh, using the NLTK to do linguistic analysis of Twitter data. You can follow along uh, with this project on GitHub, or you can see the slides at that handy-dandy URL right there. So to start, language is complicated. Um, a few months ago, I did some research on the Google Ngram data set uh, on parts of speech over time. So this is parts of speech analysis in American English going back to 1800. Um, and I found a couple of different things. I found that different parts of speech evolved together. So uh, determiners and articles uh, moved together over time, but then pronouns uh, and numerals moved apart. So that whenever pronouns went up, numerals went down and vice versa. Uh, and that those motions were affected by events, uh, by historical events. So that uh, during the Apollo landing, or, which 93% of American homes w witnessed, uh, we saw a distinct uh, decline in article use uh, for the next like 15 years, after which point it stabilized. And in the last 15 years, since the commercialization of the internet, English has gone kind of nuts. Uh, different parts of speech have gone up and down very quickly. You can see in like the last uh, 15 years here, this is some rapid change. This is incredible. Like in the last 15 years, we've seen it um, move in move faster than it's ever moved before. So I figured, okay, that's cool. But Google's Ngram data set only looks at books. So does this hold true for other mediums? So that's where Twitter comes in. Uh, Twitter has 150 million, 115 million. Uh, users that tweet every month. It generates 9,100 tweets per second. And using the public uh, stream endpoint, you can get approximately 30% of those tweets as they occur. So it's easy to get a ton of data very quickly. So for PyCon Canada, I made Flask Listen, which just streams those tweets into a database. The tools for that are to use uh, Tweepy, which is a uh, Python library for listening on, in on those streams. Uh, requests is then what I use to communicate with Cloud and uh, CouchDB-like NoSQL database service. Uh, Flask is where we run the whole thing. And then GeoNames is a web service for fleshing out geo coordinates into things like country name, province name, so on and so forth. Flask Listen has two processes to it. It has the worker process, which listens to, uh, listens to the Twitter stream uh, fleshes out that data with geo names, and then inserts the tweets into Cloudant as they occur. This is the essential code for connecting to uh, that public stream. The only custom code really is this listener. And that's uh, handling just parsing the tweets, so it's where, based on your specific needs, it's going to be the most custom. But it's still like just manipulating a dictionary, basically. Then there's the app process. Um, so the app process uh, provides two endpoints. It provides the home page and then just a count of the current number of tweets in the database so that when you visit that page, you see there are current number of tweets in the database. Some client JavaScript uh, on the home page then hits that every few seconds to update that number. That's pretty much the app process. Um, you can check it out. Um, those links uh, are active if you're following along in the slides. So then, uh, once we've got all this data, like we've got all this textual data, we've got all this uh, geographic data, so let's do cool things with it. Uh, the NLTK, or the Natural Language Toolkit, is this tremendous library for dealing with natural, natural language. So it provides tokenizers, uh, taggers, uh, algorithms for learning language, for parsing language. Um, it's a tremendous thing used in a lot of research, and it's really, really cool. But to start off, we're just going to start tokenizing this data, because we've got tweets like, uh, meaning while I'm here, just like waiting for this stuff to come off link. Um, tweets follow a somewhat non-standard grammatical pattern, if only because <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so then, 
how do we deal with this? Um, well, like, let's just see what happens if we throw the like standard word tokenize at it. Um, it breaks into like, oh, well, that actually works out pretty well. It breaks out into just words. It splits correctly uh, the I'm into I and apostrophe M. But then we get funky things with the link, where it splits into the protocol, a colon, and then the rest of the link. Um, splitting, the, splitting on the protocol is fine, because then we might be able to just count the number of links that are being shared. But that colon is going to screw up any kind of, um, any kind of punctuation analysis. So we're going to need to do better. Uh, additionally, the standard tokenizer gets really funny when you add hashtags into this. Um, we'll see that in a moment. So first, let's uh, rather than try fixing the tokenizer immediately, let's see what happens if we just start tagging parts of speech. Um, and the NLT has a method called pause tag that is just sort of the out of box recommended part of speech tagger. So we use that over our tweets, um, and it gets this. So that's an array of tuples, including the token, and then uh, what the tagger thinks its part of speech is. What those codes mean are indicated in the pen tree bank part of speech tags. So for example, that uh, the part of the link, or HTTP apparently is a noun, and the rest of the link is apparently an adjective. So that's cool. So again, this gets even funnier when we add hashtags. So most extreme elimination challenge equals best show ever. Right you are, Ken. Um, when we split this, we notice that it uh, doesn't split on the equal sign, but it does split on the pound sign. So then if we just take that, start tagging it, uh, then we notice that uh, the hashtag is a uh, past participle. So if you've ever wondered what part of speech uh, a hashtag is, now you know. It's a past participle. Joking aside, we need to fix this. So let's look at all the different kinds of tokenizers that we can use. Um, there are a lot of different ones, but these are just a sampling. So this is just the out of the box one. And it's actually just an alias to tree bank uh, word tokenizer, which uses the pen tree bank to break sentences out and tokenize. And it does some simple, like, dealing with conjugations, or not conjugations, sorry, contractions, um, and punctuation in a relatively intuitive manner. And it works great on sentences that have already been parsed. So if you run it over two sentences, you'll see funny things. If you run it over one sentence, you'll see better things. But as we already saw, it has pitfalls when dealing with things like URLs. Then there's word punct tokenize. Uh, and this just breaks on any instance of punctuation. Um, this falls down even harder on URLs. We see that the URL is broken up into seven tokens, most of which are just slashes. So that's going to make uh, analysis of punctuation even more difficult. Punct normally refers to an unsupervised algorithm for breaking up sentences. So you handed a bunch of data. It figures out how to break those sentences. It teaches itself how to break those into sentences. Um, and then inside of punct, there's a uh, word tokenizer, which we've used here. And it's functionally equivalent to word tokenizer, or to the, to the default one. So we need better. Lastly, there's just using a regular expression to split, which in this case, just given a simple pattern like break on any sequence of non-white space characters with a special case for the equal sign, um, and then anything that, again, isn't a white space character, um, then we get something much better. Uh, we again break on, break I'm into I and M, and we see that the uh, URL is broken into HTT the protocol and then the rest of the link. So that'll help us identify how many links are being shared. And then if the specific links are being shared multiple times, uh, we'll be able to see that in the unique part of the URL without messing up any analysis of uh, punctuation. So now that we've got a tokenizer that we're relatively proud of, um, let's get back to tagging. Except that, uh, you know how Twitter is generating 9,100 tweets a second? Um, parsing, tagging parts of speech takes a really long time. Even dealing with just 10,000 of them takes up more than three minutes. So if we're generating a ton of data very quickly, this is going to be unsustainable. So we need to find a better way to get a proxy for the kind of data that we're looking for. And in the case of language style analysis, like part of speech uh, is theoretically the basis for it. But um,
what language style analysis looks at uh, in terms of function words, or it looks at function words. So it breaks things into groups of function words, which are things like adjectives, pronouns, um, sorry, not adjectives, pronouns, determiners, articles, and things like that that structure the content of a sentence without themselves being content. And what exactly is a function word or like what function words are will depend on what linguist you talk to. Uh, but they're generally not nouns, verbs, and adjectives. So things like it. Um, but we all agree that they come up more in language than content words. So again, you'll say it more than share. So theoretically, we could just say, what if we take the top n tags, or the top n tokens uh, for um, a given data set? And to do that, we won't actually use the NLTK. We'll just use collections. So here we'll take our tokenizer, uh, break our tweets out into tokens, merge them into a single gigantor array, and then just grab the 10 most common. Um, and the kinds of things that come up are punctuation, function words, uh, RT, like the symbol for retweet, and then HTTP. So within the context of Twitter, I would say that the symbol RT and HTTP are, are very important for this kind of analysis. So that's, a, that's acceptable keeping those in there. And we can change our regular expression to drop punctuation. So having dealt with the NLTK and being able to then like slice and dice this data in interesting ways, uh, we can get down to graphing. So uh, the project that I linked to in the first slide, uh, if you visit it online, um, it's got this interesting graph that'll that displays tweets by region. So in the United States, there are this many tweets. In Zimbabwe, there are this many tweets. Um, and it, in looking at it, I noticed this interesting, this something I didn't expect. Who tweets more, Brasilia, sorry, Brazil or Indonesia? Ah, we'll get to that. Um, so uh, to deal with D3, um, in our HTML, we just add this div with an ID for map um, that D3 will hook onto and start adding SV, its SVG uh, into and then start manipulating that SVG inside of it. Um, then we've got some dependencies like D3 itself. Uh, Q helps us to load resources as we need them. And TopoJSON is an extension of GeoJSON that's more compact. So we can get bigger data uh, with less latency. And inside of the JavaScript, we set it up. Uh, what's happening up top is that we have all of these three-dimensional coordinates for like countries and their boundaries, but we need to map that into a two-dimensional representation. So we need to tell D3, use the Mercator representation, uh, and then scale it appropriately. And then for the SVG, like we're grabbing that map element and giving it the appropriate attributes in terms of like height and width. So then we use Q to grab our, uh, grab our resources. So uh, two of these are static resources, and one of them is actually dynamic. Um, so that view slash geo uh, query is actually calling out to Cloudin to get all of our tweets with all of our geographic information, so that on each request, that value will change. Um, but that's OK. Like, that's actually ideal. The cool part about Q, then, is that it's grabbing that and not thinking twice about it. Um, there's nothing special that we need to do for dynamic content. If it's a JSON, we just tell D3 so, and then tell it where to find it. We're good. So once that's ready, it's calls ready. Uh, if there's an error, that comes in first. Otherwise, it gives you every resource that you called for in the order that you called it for. Inside of ready um, is all of our custom code. Creating the graph itself, or in, in this case, the map is going to look like um, grabbing some data and then manipulating it in some way. D3 calls itself data-driven documents, and that's largely what happens here. Um, we select uh, from the SVG element, we grab all of our countries, and then feed it some data about countries. So if we want to give our map more data, we just manipulate that uh, countries object, which is just an array of objects. Um, then manipulating it looks a lot like this. We uh, go into each country, um, we give it a CSS class, we title it, and then we color it. 
Something similar happens for tooltips. But then how do we color it? Like we want to be coloring based on how many tweets there are relative to all the other countries. So to do that, D3 deals with uh, color or does colors via scales. So in this case, we've got uh, a logarithmic scale that takes uh, numbers between one and as many tweets as that, like whoever country has the most tweets, um, and maps it somewhere between the color black and blue. So that the most tweets is blue, uh, the least tweets is black. And then everything in between is correctly mapped to some color in between. So turns out that Indonesia tweets more. I don't know why, but now we have the data to go look into, into that. Um, who's tweeting? What are they tweeting? Um, and then how does it differ from other regions? So wrapping up, uh, language is complicated, um, but gathering data from Twitter is effortless. Uh, and the NLTK makes our lives a lot easier, but performance can quickly become an issue. We didn't even touch a lot of unsupervised learning algorithms like hidden Markov models, but uh, their performance can become a problem very quickly. However, they are really, really cool. I would highly suggest looking into them. Um, and then lastly, D3JS makes pretty graphs super easy. So with that, thanks everybody. Do we have any questions? Go for it. Hi there. Uh, so one question is, uh, you're comparing Twitter stream for um, when, when and how long? Because the problem is that mm -hmm. Indonesia and Brazil are in different time zones. Mm -hmm. So it could be the case that you're sampling during the time when Brazil's awake and Indonesia's not awake. Oh, sorry, or the other way around. Right. So um, I've got a data set that I've, I've got a listener that I've been running since <laughs> March, I think, oh. um, and it still continues. Okay, cool. Oh. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, I think it's really cool. Your project's really awesome. Uh, just wondering, uh, could you go into a little bit of details in how you incorporated um, Python and D3? I've been trying to do that for a while and didn't really make much progress on that. Oh, yeah. Um, how I integrated them. Hmm. Um, so just using Flask as my web server and then providing D3 and, as a static asset. And so, then so you can't really like, um, I was just wondering if, if it's even possible just using sort of sending Python objects to D3 oh. if that's possible. Because then you, you, you don't have to do some sort of hack where you have to go through somebody's server and then to D3. But hmm. I was just wondering if, if you came across anything while you were researching that. Hmm. Um, I didn't particularly have problems with that. but. Uh, if you're dealing in Python, then you'll probably have things that are dictionary or dictionary-like, and then mapping from dictionary into JSON, which is exactly what um, D3 is looking for, is going to be effortless. Oh, okay. So cool. if you've got a class, for example, you can um, start mangling its underscore underscore dict underscore underscore method or attribute. Okay. Um, and then that'll give you a manipulation of the data as you need. Wow. Cool. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, just just to I guess get a better understanding. So, what was the particular reason that you were actually using part of speech tagging in the beginning? Oh yeah, um, for um, so when I first started off with the, with the project, I was looking to do language style analysis, which is looking for part of was it, it intends to use parts of speech, um, and so I figured like, well, an LTK does part of speech tagging, so I figured why not use that. I'd gotten really lucky with the Google Ngram data set because they did tagging on their own, so I didn't have to do any of that processing. But this time around, I did. Anyone else? Sorry, I didn't uh, find your bio or anything. I was just wondering what your background and how you come to this problem. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm a developer of Evangelist at Cloudin. Um, and uh, I studied linguistics. Uh, I started to study linguistics in high school when I was writing a science fiction story, and I was like, I've got this race of creatures that doesn't speak any human language, so clearly I should make them one. Um, and that turned into liking linguistics a lot and starting to study it uh, both formally and informally, and then starting on projects like this, where I learn about you know, language style analysis and then see you know, what can I do with that. Um, and it's just been a hobby and a passion. So that's where I come at that. 
But professionally, yeah, I'm a developer evangelist, so I do stuff like this for a living. Um, that's all the time we have right now. But uh, just give a big thanks to, to Matt for the